you'll permit me a few moments uh, before we really get into the sermon this morning, I, I just want to, Easter seems like a good time to, uh, you know, remember where we've been and kind of review what the Lord has been doing. Uh, by the way, one thing I want to do is correct in the uh, bulletin, the Easter lilies, Dorothy Basher has um, given us a lily in memory of Dwayne Basher, obviously Dwayne Wilson got in there uh, twice somehow, so we want to make that correction. But as, we, as I thought about this last night, what, where we've been in the last year, where we've been as a congregation, the things that God is doing, I was really overwhelmed with the with thanksgiving at what, what is going on, the spiritual growth that we see, the various ministries that are going on, the calls to ministry that God seems to be putting on people's hearts. Um, some of you, if you weren't here at the annual meeting, uh, may have missed, because I'm not sure if we put anything in the bulletin about this or not, but two months ago, um, the church was, uh, was given the deed to property for a new building which we hope will be there one of these days out south of Governor's Ranch, was given to us uh, free and clear with the detention pond already taken care of that has to go on that property. We were also given the deed to, uh, to, a, to a development that will become a residential area just east of that property. We were given a third of that property, about 50 homes will reside on that. It'll give us an opportunity to... Uh, potentially realize some money for the building from the sale of those lots as they become homes and with the possibility that we will have another p- potentially hundred of those later on, approximately. So some great things are happening that way. If you've been following the building fund, you'll have noticed that in this past week, there's a 50% increase in the building fund. Uh, that's not insignificant. And uh, it's something that we're very grateful for. It's the sign of God's working in our midst. Some of you have been here for a while and, you, and you've said, well, you know, you guys don't mention the building very often. You don't mention the building fund. Uh, there's a reason for that. If there's going to be a building, we want it to be the Lord's doing. We want it to be our doing. Um, we're not twisting arms uh, to get money, but the Lord is providing it through you, through your generosity. As you respond to his call, um, great progress has been made on that already, and we anticipate that God wants us to do this. So we're looking forward to the day when it will actually be accomplished. There's a long way to go between now. And somebody asked me one day, well, aren't you dreaming of a building over there? I said, no, I don't dream of buildings. I dream of lives that are being changed. I dream of the young people that are in our congregation now that we will send out from that place hopefully one of these days to be the the missionaries taking the gospel to the hard places in this world. I dream of those who will become the pastors of the next generation. I dream of those who will become the farmers, who will become the teachers, who will become the godly uh, doctors and whatever other calling that the Lord puts on their life. That's what I dream of. We have a great opportunity together as we respond to God's call on our lives individually to do something wonderful together. We will be responsible for our time on this corner at this time in this place. Beloved, one day God will call us all to account. And what a wonderful thing to see what he is doing and to anticipate what he will do in the days to come. And so I think it's a great time to give him thanks it's a great time to anticipate what may be yet for us to do. So would you stand with me? Let's have a word of prayer together of thanksgiving. Father, we thank you for these many, many manifestations of your presence in our midst. We don't have to look very far to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the way that you have put your hand on the lives of various people. I I thank you this morning for every ministry that's going on, for every teacher who is teaching our young people in the Sunday school and at other times, preparing for that. And I pray that you will grace them as they do that, to be faithful to your word and to to love these young people, for those who are teaching Bible studies, for those who are facilitating small groups, for all of those kind of ministries. I pray for them. I pray that you will expand them. I pray that you will grow us in our bonds together in Christ. I thank you for the 
progress that's being made with regard to potential building, and we still look to you, Father, to be the one to create that eventuality if you desire it to be so, but we thank you for the progress that's being made in that direction. And we ask that when and if that day comes, all the glory will go to you. Our prayer is that there will be young people and young lives influenced and sent out from there. And in fact, adult lives as well, sent out from there as ministers, prepared and equipped to take the gospel to those who do not know. This is our, it's our prayer and it's the desire of our heart. We pray for all the missionaries that you've given us to pray for. We pray, Father, for the ministries that they're involved in, translation work, sharing the gospel, making available technology. All of these things are covered. Taking care of those who cannot take care of themselves. So many ministries. Thank you for the ministry that Stan and Sicily have. They'll be sending these people on the honor flight in just another few weeks. We pray for their success and we pray for their safety as they go and we thank you for this wonderful opportunity. But Father, most of all this morning as we stand here, we bow in humble adoration to the Lord Jesus Christ who is alive and well. We thank you for this day of remembering that. And I pray that this morning you will bring home to us as never before. Number one, the, the fact that this is a true thing. It's not just a fairy tale. It's not just something we say to each other to make each other feel good. It's something that's actually happened. Number one, and I thank you secondly, Father, for those who know you and have committed their life to you and for those who haven't, I pray that this would be the day. There'd be no more putting it off. That there would no be, no, be no more saying later, but that today would be the day. And so we commit these requests to you with thanksgiving in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and as you are, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Those of you who have been here for the last two or three weeks know that, well, number one, I should thank Jesse for filling in last week. Thank you wherever you are, Jesse, uh, for doing that. I've heard most of that sermon. I haven't quite heard all of it. I need to get the rest of it because I need it, but uh, I'm practicing on 1 John chapter 4 uh, to make sure I get it right, that I love the Lord. So thank you for filling in. But we've taken a little vacation from Luke to look at 1 Corinthians 15, these first eight or nine verses. Wonderful verses, one of the great passages in all of the Bible. And uh, so that's where we've been, and we finished that little study up this morning. Let me begin with a story about a patient. He goes in to his, see a psychiatrist. And uh, he says, uh, hey, doc, I, I, I'm feeling very schizophrenic today. And the doctor looks at him, and he says, well, that makes four of us. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I found that happening, I'd be a little concerned about that doctor, would you not? His credibility would be questioned by the fact that he doesn't seem, seems like he's just as sick as I am. That would, that would concern me. And I think it should, should concern us if we find somebody's credibility is on the line. So if you remember that, as we go through this brief review of this passage, we see that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has been reminding the Corinthians of the greatest news that's ever been given to mankind. The good news. That's what the gospel, word gospel means that you find there in the first verses. The good news that Jesus Christ has died and been buried and risen again so that we can have forgiveness of sins, so that we can have cleansed hearts, so that we can have a clean slate. All of that's possible, but it's only because God has provided the gospel. So the gospel provided in verses 3 and 4, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the gospel provided. That's the, that's the foundation of the whole thing. And notice that it's all what God does. There's nothing of what you and I do there to provide salvation. The good news is Jesus. You're not good news. I'm not good news. Jesus Christ is good news. That's the foundation. But now in verses 1 and 2, we found that the good news has to be possessed. 
So Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what he's saying to them, here's the gospel, and it's been provided by God, but it's no good unless you're reaching out and taking it. The gift has to be unwrapped. It must be received by you by faith in order for it to be effective. And so we have the gospel possessed in verses one and two. But now he comes to the last part of this section where he's gonna answer this question because you can hear people saying to Paul, well, Paul, okay, this is all great, but how do I know it's true? How do I know that what you're saying about this person, Jesus Christ, is true? How do I know that he can really provide me with this new life? And Paul's answer is very, very simple. How do I know that Jesus can give you new life? Because Jesus gave himself new life. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is life. He's not a doctor that has the same disease that you do. He's a savior who has the solution to your problem. And he's demonstrated it in his resurrection. His resurrection proves everything that he said and did and everything that he was about in his life. His resurrection was sensational. It was verifiable. It was compelling. It's redemptive. And best of all, it's transferable. The new life that Jesus had, he can give to you and to me if we'll just ask. That's the gospel. And so he's saying the resurrection is everything, therefore. Everything hinges on the resurrection. If you get down to verse 17 in this chapter, you'll see Paul saying there, and if Christ is not raised, your faith is futile you are still in your sins. In other words, if there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. If there's no resurrection, there's no truth to what we do, might as well fold up our tents and go home. The resurrection is everything. The resurrection is the final piece of the puzzle. See, that the perfect life, all the miracles, all the authoritative preaching and teaching, all of the compassion that Jesus shed. It's, it's absolutely useless if there's no resurrection. It's the final piece of the puzzle. Listen, those of, those of you who know baseball know that you can, you can take a very fine pitched game into the night. You can, you, can have, you can have two outs in the ninth inning with two strikes on the last batter and there's been no hits up to that point, but you don't have a, a no hitter until you get to the last out, right? Ask Dave Steeb. You say, who's Dave Steeb and how would I ask him? I don't know who he is or where he, where he is, but I can tell you this. I can tell you that he took a no-hitter into the ninth inning with two outs in the ninth inning and two strikes on the last batter, not once, but twice in his career, two starts in a row, in fact, September 24th and September 30th, 1988, and both times he lost the no-hitter. He didn't get it because somebody got a hit off of him. You got to get the last strike. That's what the resurrection is, beloved. It's it's, It's the thing that holds everything else together. It's the thing that proves and demonstrates the reality of what Jesus was all about. If there is no resurrection, there is no gospel, and there's no life to offer to anybody. But Jesus is alive. Jesus was resurrected. Listen, The weight of the evidence for the resurrection, the weight of evidence for the resurrection is absolutely overwhelming. You have a lot more trouble explaining the facts that we do know if you don't believe in the resurrection than if you do. You have the empty tomb, which no one has ever denied or been able to explain satisfactorily apart from the resurrection. You have the extra biblical sources, things, about, things that are uh, writings outside of the Bible that talk about the possibility of a resurrection. You have the 
martyrs who gave witness to the resurrection. You had the fact that there was the establishment of a church that Rome did everything it could to wipe out in the early days of Christianity and yet could not. So the church has survived long after Rome was gone. All of those are evidences of the truth of this resurrection, but that's not where Paul goes. Paul goes to eyewitness accounts. Paul is like, I, I kind of view him in this chapter, as, he's like an attorney standing before the judge and he's calling his various witnesses to the stand to bear witness to the truth of what he's saying. That's what he's doing here. You know, Deuteronomy 17 verse 6 said, you can't have capital punishment. You can't put somebody to death except you have on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, it says. Paul is saying, I can give you a lot more than that. I can do a lot better than two or three witnesses. Listen, if Easter is nothing more to you than some Easter bunnies and some Easter eggs, listen up. Because here's what Easter is really about. It's not about the possibility of saving yourself. It's not about the possibility of new life somehow being derived from some ethereal, spiritual way that we don't understand. This is about the gospel that's rooted in time and in history. And Paul is saying the, the key to the whole thing is that Jesus is alive and here's how I know he's alive. Number one, first witness, Peter saw him. Peter saw him. Verse five, 1 Corinthians 15, and he appeared to Cephas. It's another name for Peter. He appeared to Peter. Now in Luke 24, um, we didn't get that far today. We read the first 12 verses, but later on in that chapter, we read the account of two disciples who are on their way home to Emmaus on the day of the resurrection when Jesus appears to them. They don't recognize him at first, but later on they do, and then they go running back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples who had gathered there that they'd seen the resurrected Christ. But when they got there, their story was almost uh, not heard because of the excitement that was already existing in that room that's recorded in Luke 24, verse 34, where they say the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, another name for Peter. He's appeared to Peter. So Paul calls his first witness, Peter. Peter, did you see the risen Christ? Yes, I did. I saw the risen Christ. I was with John earlier that day. And Mary Magdalene came back and all excited because she said that the tomb is open and it's empty. We thought she was kidding, so we went running to the tomb, John and I did. And when we got there, we looked and sure enough, the tomb was empty and, and the clothes were still lying there, the linens that Jesus had been wrapped in. And we thought, boy, that's strange. And he said, John believed right away. He said, I still was very skeptical. I didn't really understand what had happened. I thought someone had stolen the body away for some reason and moved it. But it wasn't very long that day before Jesus appeared to me. Jesus came to me personally. What did he say to you, Peter? That's between me and Jesus. I think we have a taste of it in John 21 where we see Jesus publicly dealing with the fact that Peter had just denied him three times. But Peter had seen Jesus. Why a special appearance to Peter? Now, he appeared to the rest of them eventually as well. I suppose we could say, well, Peter's the leader of the group, so it's natural that Jesus would appear to him as the leader of the group, and I think that's true. But I think there's another reason that Jesus appeared, especially to Peter, and I think it has to do with the fact that everybody by the time Paul wrote this, which is about 20, 25 years later, after the resurrection of Christ, everybody had heard that knew anything about Christianity, everybody had heard about how Peter, the night Jesus had crucified, had stood up and boasted that he would go to his death for Jesus. And instead, when the opportunity came and Jesus got arrested, Peter did rather than go to his death, he denied him three times, swearing. I never knew him. 
He was disgraced. He was humiliated. He was shamed. He was coward. And yet they also knew that seven weeks later, Peter gave the great sermon that began the church on the streets of Jerusalem in front of the very same people who had crucified Christ. He called them to task for the fact that they had crucified their own Messiah. And he said, the one you crucified, by the way, God raised from the dead. That's, you don't want to be on the wrong side of that equation. 3,000 people came to know Christ that day. And Peter continued to preach that gospel of the resurrection of Christ until he got arrested eventually and they called him in. And they said, you got to stop preaching this. And he said, well, you give me two choices. I'm going to obey you or I'm going to obey God. Guess where, guess where my allegiance is going to be? And he went out and he continued to preach this. This is the same man who denied Christ for fear of these people before. Why the change in his life? Because he'd met Jesus. He'd seen the resurrected Christ. It's the only explanation for what happened to Peter. How could one so fearful become so fearless? Because he'd seen the resurrection. There's a great side note here with Peter because we see a great exhibition of grace in Peter's life, right? How, how did Peter feel after he had denied Christ those three times? Well, Luke tells us he went out and wept bitterly. Couldn't believe that he had done that. Couldn't believe that as Jesus is being led away to be crucified, he's denying that he ever knew him. Shook Peter to the depths of his being to find out that that's what was really inside of him. We all need to know what's inside of us, don't we? I don't know how many of you read that faith column yesterday where a guy said, you know, by the time he was a kid, he had never done anything that somebody would have to die for him. Yeah, it's because he hasn't seen who he is. He doesn't understand what's in his heart. Peter really didn't either. But all of a sudden he understood what was in his heart. And so Jesus came to him. And I think what, Peter, what Jesus did was in a special way. He graced Peter with his forgiveness. Why? You, know, you have to ask yourself, how come Peter and not Judas? Both of them betrayed their Lord. Both of them turned tail when things got tough and ran. So why Peter and not Judas? Well, the only answer to that question can be that Judas' heart had already hardened against Jesus. Jesus didn't meet his expectations. He wanted to define Jesus rather than let Jesus define him. And Jesus didn't meet the expectations that Judas had for a political ruler who would kick the Romans out. And so, and so he hardened his heart against Jesus, but not Peter. He was overtaken by fear for a time. He failed in a very dramatic fashion. But because his heart was toward Jesus, Jesus saw that repentant heart and he extended grace to him. That's great to know, isn't it? Because we all have our moments, don't we? I can tell you for sure I've had mine. Thankfully, when Jesus sees a heart that's right, he, he forgives. You know, the renewed courage of Peter points unmistakably toward a resurrection that he couldn't even believe at first. When he first heard the word, he didn't believe that happened. One of my most devastating basketball moments, and there were many, but one of them wasn't, didn't really involve my playing. It was, it was something else. It happened on May 8th, 1970. And I know most of you here probably don't care about that, but it was very important to me because the Los Angeles Lakers were playing the New York Knicks and they were in game seven of the NBA Finals on May 8th, 1970. So this was the final game to determine who was going to be the champion. Now you have to realize the history of this. I'd been through... I'd, I'd been through six losses to the Boston Celtics with the Lakers during the 1960s. It was a tough, it was a tough decade. And here they are with their chance finally to win their first world championship. Well, what had happened during that series is Willis Reed, who was the great star for the New York Knicks, pulled a muscle in game five. Couldn't even play in game six. Was not expected to play in game seven. He was absolutely dead to his team, and everybody thought the Lakers are going to win because 
Willis Reed can't play. But moments before the game started, I, I can still see this in my mind's eye. This is how indelibly it's etched into my mind, into my memory. Coming out between the stands there, in the background you could see that there was light behind the doors that opened. And then here came this silhouette of Willis Reed limping out through the walkway there, onto the court. The crowd went wild. The team, you could see the smiles come on their face. Here's Willis Reed limping out. He started the game. He made his two first shots. That was it for the day. He was done, but that's all it took. His inspiration to his team led to the New York Knicks beating the Lakers that day, 113 to 99. You can look it up. I remember it very well. <laughs> but you see, beloved, that's what happened to Peter. The one he thought was dead and gone and of no significance anymore was suddenly alive and he was well. And so Peter's exhibit number one, he saw Jesus and it changed his whole life. Witness number two, Paul says, let's get the apostles up here. The apostles to the witness box. Verse five, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. That's the 12 minus Judas. They all saw Jesus risen. Why is their testimony important? Their testimony is important, beloved, because every single one of them except John died for their faith. Every one of them except John died for their faith. Explain that. Well, some people have said, that's just mass hallucination. Mass hallucination. They just thought Jesus was alive. So Lee Strobel, when he wrote his book, The Case for Christ, suggested that to Gary Collins. Gary Collins is a PhD in psychology, professor, author of dozens of books, past president of the National Association of Psychologists. Collins told him this. Hallucinations are individual occurrences. Hallucinations are individual occurrences. By their very nature, only one person can see a given hallucination at a time. They certainly are not something which can be seen by a group of people. Hallucinations are subjective and personal. So what he's saying is, if the disciples were hallucinating, it's the first and only mass hallucination in history. I'm pretty sure that's not what happened. What did happen? They saw the risen Christ. Listen, just think about this for a moment. Even if they were mass hallucinating and they're preaching resurrection on the streets of Jerusalem and the, and the religious leaders want to get rid of them and they want to stop this message, what would they have had to do? The only thing they had to do is walk out the tomb and show people the dead Christ. It didn't happen because there was no dead Christ. Mass hallucination won't answer the question. Well, so, so perhaps it was a conspiracy. Perhaps they decided, man, we got to explain the last three years of our, how, how, how are we going to explain to our wives that we went away and spent three years with this guy and now, now he's gone, let alone our friends and neighbors. So let's just put a story together here about a resurrection and, and you know, we'll just, we'll just kind of make up this religion and we'll go out and preach this. Chuck Colson who knows something about conspiracies. He was the hatchet man for Richard Nixon, some of you will remember, who was involved in the Watergate scandal, later came to faith in Christ. He said, the odds against 11 men starting a conspiracy like this are incredibly difficult, but when you think that at least another 500 people are gonna have to be complicit in it, this, it's not possible. It's beyond the realm of any kind of possibility, he says this, he said, to, describe, to subscribe to this argument, one must also be ready to believe that each disciple was willing to be ostracized by family and friends, to live in daily fear of prison or death, live penniless and hungry, sacrifice family, be tortured without mercy, and ultimately die all without ever once denying that Jesus had risen from the dead. 
He says, uh, let me tell you about my companions in Watergate. He said, you know what? There was a conspiracy there, all right, and they all broke eventually, including me. But he said, we didn't go running to the prosecutors because we were concerned about the Constitution, <laughs> because we were worried about maybe our way of government was going to go away. He said, every one of us went to save our own neck. Right? And then he applies it to this. He said, even political zealots at the pinnacle of power will save their own necks in the crunch though it may be at the expense of the one they profess to serve so zealously. His point is, these guys didn't go to their death proclaiming this message knowing it's not true. People don't die, beloved, for a lie. You say, well, what about those guys, you know, that flew the airplanes into the buildings on 9-11? Didn't they die for a lie? Yes, they did. They'd been told that 70 virgins awaited them in paradise if they would give their life in this cause. In fact, it was the only way that they could make sure they were going to heaven is if they gave their life in the cause. And they had subscribed to that belief. But believe, there's a huge difference between that and the apostles. These guys who flew the airplanes into the buildings didn't know for sure. They hadn't been there to see those 70 virgins they thought awaited them on the other side. Nobody else had come back from there to tell them about that. But the disciples knew for sure, one way or the other, right? They either had seen Jesus or they hadn't. They said they had. If they hadn't, they died for a lie. Nobody does that. What would be the point of that? The very death of these men, the blood of these men. And believe me, they didn't die easy deaths. Speared to death in one case, crucified upside down in another case, clubbed to death, skinned alive. They died horrendous deaths. Their blood testifies to the certainty this is true. I'm not dying for something that I know to be a lie, would you? So the testimony of the apostles it's so significant. It's profound testimony to the truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So we have the apostles. Witness number three. Number three. 500 brothers. 500 brothers. Verse six. The witness box is getting crowded, right? 500 brothers. Verse 6, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Why are they important? Well, they're important, number one, their sheer number is important, 500 of them. That's no small number of people who at one time, that's not saying this is all that saw Jesus alive, it's just saying this was all at one time this many saw Jesus alive. They're important because of their sheer number. But they're more important even than that because of what Paul says next, most of whom are still alive. Why does he throw that in? That's a challenge. What he's saying to those who are hearing his message is, if you don't believe me, go see them. A lot of them are still living. I'm not telling you something that's not true that can't be verified. So go talk to the eyewitnesses. Go interview them. This whole area of the Middle East is a very small area. All you got to do is get on your camel for a few miles and you can go find as many witnesses as you want. I'm not telling you something that's not true. Go check it out. Paul made appeal in a, kind of a similar way back in Acts later in his life. If you turn to Acts chapter 26, Acts 26 he was on trial later in his life for his life, something that he didn't do because people didn't like his message. They had trumped up charges on him. And in, in one case, he had been rescued from Jerusalem and sent to Caesarea Maritime, which is on the eastern border of Palestine. He was in jail there for a while. And he was first under a guy named uh, Felix, and then he was under a guy named Festus. And, uh, and Festus was there with him, and, and the king of the whole region, King Herod Agrippa, came to see him as well. And, and he's before all of those guys. 
in Acts chapter 26. And he says this beginning in verse 24. Acts 26, verse 24. It says, and as he was saying these things in his defense, basically preaching the gospel, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning, your five PhDs, it's all driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words for the king, Agrippa, who was there. The king knows these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. What he's saying is, I know that King Agrippa knows all about this. He's the ruler over Palestine and Galilee. The whole area had been reconstructed under King Agrippa, what his grandfather, King Herod, had, had, had previously put all together, and now he's got it again. And Paul is saying, I know this was all, this was all talked about. It was, the, it was the talk of the town. It was the talk of the country. He knows these things are true. He knows there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. He knows the preaching that's gone on. He knows the inability to put to rest this story. And you can make fun all you want, but the facts bear out the truth. Jesus is alive. 500 brothers at one time. Witness number four, back in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse seven. 1 Corinthians 15, verse seven. Then he appeared to James. James, well, that's good. Who's James? Why is James significant? Here's why James is significant. James is significant because James is the brother of Jesus. Jesus. And because he is the leader by this time of the church in Jerusalem, as Peter and John and all the other apostles spread across the world to take the gospel to all of these other places, James had become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And secondly, James is is important because James was originally hostile. He's a hostile witness. I want to find out a little bit about James. Let's go, first of all, to Mark chapter 6. So just turn back to the gospels. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. And we start to get a little bit of an inkling about the family of Jesus that's recorded here. In Mark 6, chapter chapter 6, in verse 2, we read this. When Jesus had had come to his own hometown early in his ministry, this is the setting for this account in Mark 6, verse 2. Kind of the middle of the verse there, it says, where did this, the people are speaking, they say, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? They've they've known him as a carpenter for 30 years. All of a sudden, he's teaching things that they they could never have imagined. He's pulling things out of the Old Testament they never saw there. They didn't understand what this said. The Bible says that. I didn't know the Bible said that. That was their reaction. He spoke as one having authority, not like the scribes who kept quoting this guy and that guy. Jesus just said, this is the way it is. And they were amazed and they said, where did he get this wisdom? What is the wisdom given to him? How are these mighty things done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, there's our James, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? This is Jesus' family. Now, if you want to get a little more insight into Jesus' family, turn to Mark chapter 3. Just back up a couple pages. Mark 3 and verse 20. This is Jesus' family, but they were anything but supportive of his ministry. Mark 3 verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. He's being so pressed by this time by the people who are responding to his ministry. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. He's out of his mind. Are you kidding me? He's left his senses. That was the opinion of Jesus' family. They thought he was crazy. He was an embarrassment. It got so bad that his brothers tried to send him to Jerusalem a couple years later, knowing that by that time he was public enemy number one, that they in Jerusalem wanted to kill him, 
according to John 5, verse 18. And his brothers wanted to send him there. It's in John chapter 7, verse 2. If you want to look there, John 7 and verse 2. It says there concerning Jesus' brothers, they told him, leave here, he's in Galilee, and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. So they're really in his corner, right? Trying to get him to be more widespread. Now, that's not the issue. Verse 4, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. What are they doing? They're trying to send him down to his death. They'd rather he either stopped what he's doing, stay in Galilee, or if you're going to keep on doing it, go on down there to Judea where they're going to kill you. That's what Jesus' brothers thought of his ministry. Now turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Now we're a few weeks later, Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has risen again. Jesus, by this time, has ascended back to the Father. And we find this in Acts 1 and verse 14. All these, it's all of his disciples, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So what gives? How can these guys be part of a lynch mob one moment, trying to send Jesus down to his death, and now they're in a prayer meeting a few days later? And James is in the middle of all this, of course, apparently the oldest of the brothers. We don't know that, but because he's listed first in Mark, it's probable that he is. He's the one who wrote the, the book of James in the New Testament. James is in the middle of all this. Lynch mob one moment, prayer meeting the next. What happened? What turned this hostile witness into a witness to, for the defense? He saw his risen brother. He saw the resurrected Christ. Changed everything. For James, nothing else explains James' turnaround. He'd have been happy to be rid of him. The historian Hegesippus from the first century relates that James prayed so frequently that his knees became hard as a camel's. That's his words. Therefore, James was given the nickname Old Camel Knees, praying to the brother that he had discounted. Both Hegesippus and Josephus testify that James was stoned to death for his his faith in his brother. As he was the leader in the church in Jerusalem, eventually that happened after the time of the book of Acts. For preaching Jesus, he gave his life. How do you explain that? He knew he was alive, beloved. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, one more witness. Witness number five. Paul himself. He saved the most hostile witness of all for the end. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. He, he was not kidding when he said, I persecuted the church. Paul wanted to wipe it out. He wanted to wipe the church, Christianity, from the face of the earth. We see Paul, first time we see him in, in the Bible is in the seventh chapter of Acts when he's holding the coats of those who, who are stoning Stephen to death, the first martyr in the New Testament. Saul is there holding the coats for them. But that was just the beginning. He took it upon himself then to begin to persecute Christians as they begin to leave Jerusalem. You would have thought that'd be good enough. They're getting out of town, let them go. Not Paul. He's after them. He pursues them. He's on his way to Damascus to catch some of them when we come to the, seventh, to the ninth chapter of Acts. And in Acts chapter nine, he tells what happened. He was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord in verse one. 
And then it tells us in verse 3, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone round about him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? How would you like to hear that? Why are you persecuting me? Why are you after my people? And being after them, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. Dead people don't say that. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Dead men don't talk. Paul came face to face with the risen Christ. The change was dramatic in his life. You know how dramatic the change was in Paul's life? You know, Paul, after he heard this, a man named Ananias came, and because Paul was blind for three days, this man came and laid his hands on him, and he sighed again at the Lord's instruction this all happened. And then Paul tells us in Galatians that he went out and he went into the wilderness for three years and was being taught there by the Lord. As far as we can tell, it was the Lord himself who was teaching them, as far as I can tell. But we know that he certainly went away to be taught for a period of time. It was only three years later that he actually came back to Jerusalem. Three years had passed. And when he came back to Jerusalem after three years, guess what? Acts 9.26, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Three years later, that guy made an impression because he was so hostile. That's how violent he had been. So what caused the unbelievable turnaround that caused him to go on the road and endure beatings? And he tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, five times he was beaten with an inch of his life with his 39 whips. I mean, have you ever seen the picture of that slave they always show from the Civil War era that has these, these, these scars all over his back? That's what Paul's back looked like. Had to. He'd been whipped so many times. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd been persecuted. He'd been mocked. He went through all of this. Why did he do that for the cause that he was trying to wipe out? Because he'd seen Christ. He knew Jesus was alive. He saw the risen Christ and it changed his life. So beloved, those are Paul's witnesses. Are they convincing? I think any one of those witnesses taken by themselves is compelling, right? But you, you take the cumulative you take them cumulatively, you take the weight of the evidence of those witnesses and they're overwhelmingly in favor of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And perhaps you notice that whenever somebody met the risen Christ, their life changed. Did you notice that? Every single time because when you come in contact with Jesus, when you really know him, you may think you know him, but my question is, <laughs> not did you say a prayer, did you tear a card, did you do this, did you do that? My question is, is your life different than it used to be? Because that's the test. Life's change when people come to know Jesus Christ. That's the test. Things change. And let me tell you, the same Jesus that these eyewitnesses met is still living. He is still changing lives. He's still in the business, beloved, of doing what he's always done. Has he changed your life? Let me give you one example. Lee Strobel was a graduate of Yale Law School. I've talked about him before. Legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. Hard drinking, roused about. Was absolutely floored one night when he came home and his wife announced that she'd become a Christian. He didn't even know she was looking. Here's what he says about that. He said, I had married one Leslie, the fun Leslie, the carefree Leslie, the risk-taking Leslie, and now I feared she was going to turn into some sort of sexually repressed prude who would trade our upward mobile lifestyle for all night prayer vigils and volunteer work in grimy suit kitchens. No wonder he was scared, right? <coughs> Not a pleasant thought. Instead, I was pleasantly surprised, even fascinated, by the fundamental changes in her character, in her integrity, in her interpersonal confidence. He was impressed enough that this hard-bitten journalist decided to go do his own investigation. He took two years to go across the country and uh, uh, doing interviews with people, pro and con, the resurrection of Jesus Christ to see what he could find out. That was the basis of his book, The Case for Christ. 
He came to the point where he says on November 8th, 1981, he's sitting in his room and he's realizing, you know what? It takes more faith to believe that Jesus wasn't resurrected than to believe that he was. What kind of fool do I want to be here? So he says this, he said, in light of the convincing facts I had learned during my investigation in the face of this overwhelming avalanche of evidence in the case for Christ, the great irony was this, it would require much more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to trust in Jesus of Nazareth. He met the risen Christ. You think it changed him? Here's what he says about the transformation he went through. He said, I may not yet be the man I should be or the man with Christ's help I someday will be, but thank God I am not the man I used to be. And here's the evidence he offers up. I love this evidence. It's amazing evidence. A few months after he came to faith in Christ, his little five-year-old daughter named Allison came up to her mother and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. Is that good or what? I want God to do for me what he did for daddy. That's a five-year-old who got it. She not only understood there was a change in dad, she understood she needed a change. I'm not suggesting that every five-year-old can get that, but I think she got it. Here's my question. Would anybody around you say, I want what he's got? I want what she's got. Would anybody say that? Because that should be true of those who belong to Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus' resurrection, now listen to this, last comment. Just as Jesus' resurrection was the pivotal moment in human history, accepting him as your Lord and Savior can be the pivotal moment in your history, and it needs to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this challenge from your word. We thank you for the gospel. It just says we can't do it, but what we can't do, you've already done. You've already lived the life we can't live. You've already died the death that we can't die. You've already paid the price that we can't pay. You've already done everything. Salvation is provided. Now in order to possess it, we just need to reach out and say yes. I confess my sin, I give you my life. I say yes to you. And the proof of it all, Father, is right there in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The living Lord who is here today. The living Lord whom we have not only seen evidence of in the scripture, but we've seen evidence among our own little congregation here. Thank you so much for that. We look forward to what else we're gonna see that you wanna do in and through us. Not because we deserve it, not because we're good, not because there's anything about us that would cause you to move our direction, except we give you a heart that is toward you. Thank you that when we do, We find their grace abundantly, overflowing. So I pray again, Father, anyone who's heard this, maybe even assented to the facts, but hasn't really put their faith in you, would you please, right now, reach into their heart, cause them to realize the need that they have for you, the extreme selfishness that it's the depth of their being, the fact that they live only for themselves and that alone would be rebellion against you. And would you put into their heart, Father, the faith to believe in you, to trust in you, to give over to you, repent of their sins and become today child of God, adopted into the family, heart cleansed, slate clean, ready to go. Thank you, it can happen just that quickly and that easily. May it be true as we sing together, as we end our service in Jesus' name. Amen.